Okay, so we're going to talk about tree huggers. Any, any tree huggers here? Yeah, tree huggers, yeah. You would chain yourself to a tree rather than see someone cut it down. You would throw yourself in front of a, a tree trimming outfit. No, I'm just joking with you. But we do have some extreme people, sometimes known as hyper-environmentalists or you name it. But some people care more about the environment than they do about babies. If you look at some of these commercials, they want to make dogs and cats at the same level of people. Give. If you don't give, this dog may not make it to 15. <laughs> we'll give you t-shirts if you'll commit to 50 bucks a month. Now, I love animals too, but I'm going to tell you, that some of that is not normal. See, some of that is in devaluing humans. We want to lift up an animal kingdom and make them on the same level. Guess what? It's not biblical. You might be liberal, but it's not biblical. So tree huggers kind of come with that connotation that they're usually hyper-environmentalists. In most cases, most hyper-environmentalists are usually theologically going to be an atheist or an agnostic. Why? Because what drives a hyper-environmentalist is we gotta, we got to save our mother. Hello? You see those bumper stickers? Save your mother. Love your mother. And it's got a picture of the earth. I'll tell you what, it's not my mama. <laughs> she really didn't have that shade of green. And I know she had a shape and it was round, but not round like that. But see, that's ridiculous. If you're biblical, you say, we come from the Father's hand. If you're a secularist, you say, we're here by virtue of some big bang, and the earth is our mother. Completely, completely different philosophies, you understand that. And so, aside from the negative connotations of being a tree hugger, uh, there are lots of things that the Bible has to say about trees. And then on that basis only, consider me a tree hugger. Amen. Other than that, Amen. off with their heads. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I love trees. And unless you think I'm against recycling or any of that kind of stuff, I'm not. Ask my wife. I'm a pretty rabid recycler. She'll throw stuff in the trash sometimes, and I'll go to throw something in there. I'll say, uh-uh. That can is not going to stay there. So please, no text or email. But the fact is, if I do that, and when I do that, it's because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the Lord says, take care of my place. But not becomes because some professor tells me. That the earth is coming to an end and we better take care of our mother. Right. Go take care of your mother. You know. Okay. So the good tree hugging. What may it commence? You see the top of your outlines this morning. Isaiah 61. This was a, a prophetic, of course, allusion to Jesus who would come. And prophetically, here's what Isaiah says. He said, the Messiah's mission will be to include what? To give comfort to those who mourn in Zion, giving them beauty for ashes. There's a substitution, right? There's a swap that goes on. The Lord, how many of you know when you come to the Lord, you get filled with his spirit, you get filled with his joy. He provides beauty where there's been sackcloth and ashes and brokenness. The Lord brings healing and health, deliverance, joy. A whole new perspective and a whole new future. Why? Because the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you. And the devil will never have the final say. And so Jesus kind of encapsulates and embodies this whole message. He gives comfort to those who mourn in Zion. He gives them beauty for ashes. He gives them the oil of joy. Instead of mourning. You know what? We can have loss in life, and we will. 
We can lose at some things, but it doesn't make us losers. We can suffer some pains and some loss and some deprivation of this or that and the other thing. But guess what? If the Lord's with us in it, we still come out victorious. Because Paul kind of gets, gets that whole message in Romans 8, 37. He said, what shall we say to all the affairs of life? Here's what he says is the bottom line. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. That's it. So he kind of summarizes every challenge in life and everything the devil might try and do. And he said, what shall we say? What's the bottom line to all these things? What is our response? <clears throat> in all these things, we're more than conquerors. So he said, I'll give you the oil of joy where you've had sackcloth and ashes and mourning if you will give me your pain. <clears throat> I remember when I was growing up seeing, in my case, seeing these old Italian women, <clears throat> they would lose a spouse or, you know, a loved one, and they would have, you know, black dress, black on from head to toe. I'm sure other cultures do it too, but they would be really in, into the black the dress and all this kind of stuff and then the veil. But the problem is that would go on and on and on and on and on. In some cases, never wear any other color. Why? Because when someone dies in Christ, guess what? They're transitioned from time to eternity, from here to glory. But when an unbeliever dies, everyone in their heart of hearts would love to believe and self-medicate that their loved one is going to a better place. Sometimes they hesitate saying heaven, but they'll just kind of give the generic better place designation. But how many of you know that in their heart of hearts, they know that sometimes the person in the casket has been a scoundrel? Then what? Then what? Does a great person get in and scoundrels as well? See, so people don't even want to go there in their theology. They don't even want to go there in their thinking because they're afraid of what they might find. So there's hopelessness, just like Hinduism, for example. The whole idea of reincarnation was brought to bear because of the scales of karma. Right? So if you came as a beetle in your former life, and I don't mean George, John, Ringo, and Paul... I mean the one that you get the raid out for. So if you came as a real beetle and you want to matriculate into this system and move up to a higher life form, that means that your good deeds have to cosmically outweigh your bad deeds. But you know why it's a hopeless theology? Because you never know when you've done just enough to make it up to a cat size. Or down to an amoeba. So to try and bridge that gap of hopelessness, this whole idea of reincarnation. Well, if you don't get it right this time, let another life cycle go around, give it another shot. How many of you know that's hopelessness? The Bible's clear. Jesus said, you can know the way. Because Thomas said, Lord, how do we know the way? We know you're going somewhere, but how are we going to get there? He said, oh, you know the way. What do you mean we know the way? Yeah, I am the way. I am the way. Not just believe in me, but live for me. Believe in me and then let that belief reshape your agenda and live for me. And that where I am, you can go to the place I've prepared for you and not miss the train. See, we can go home right now. <laughs> Anyhow, he said, I'm going to give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You know, that's part of the reason why we have praise and worship the way we do. A, we don't have a church that's devoid of worship. Or B, the next worst thing would be, let's sing one dead song and all sit down. One dead song sung by a bunch of dead people singing it. No, we have lively, anointed, yes. Jesus-honoring, plugged-in worship. Why? Because we have people singing and playing that love the Lord and are turned on to Jesus. Hallelujah. 
So this atmosphere is consecrated to him. It belongs to him. And we give him all the glory here. Because without his presence, there's no hope of transformation. You can do anything else you want. Have the most beautiful church building in town. Without his presence, there's no hope of transformation of life. And praise and worship gets us out of our own mindset and out of ourself and into his space. Because we come in with baggage. We come in with hassles and headaches and stresses and maybe some disappointing news or things we're wrestling with or things that we know we're going to have to wrestle with. And man, how do you cope with that and still get something out of a message? Here's how you do it. Take all that stuff and leave it at the foot of the cross. Because Jesus comes in the person of his spirit and he said, listen, my presence will drive away the darkness. But leave it at my feet. And I'll give you a garment of praise. Blow away that spirit of heaviness. And you will leave different than when you walked in. Come in any way you got to come in. Now, preferably, you come in ready to rock. But if, but if, you, you know, if you're not in that space right now because of situations, then come anyway. But make sure that when you come, you come prepared to give. And the first thing you need to give is all the junk and leave it at the foot of the cross. So that your heart and mind could be refreshed and plowed up and ready for the good seed of his word. Otherwise, it's like give, getting the best seed you can buy and putting it on concrete. Don't blame the seed. Blame the soil. Say, Lord, plow up the soil of my heart. I don't want my heart and my mind to be like fallow ground, ground that was once plowed and now dust and time and wind and rain and dry and heat. and It's like so baked, it's like clay. You put a seed on there, it can't penetrate down in there, and the wind comes and takes it away, or the birds have lunch. So he said, I want to give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You see how just the opening text would get a whole message out of it. That's the way God's word is. Once you start to drill down, you find these tributaries that are awesome. Now, if you're not even being affected by this, then pray that the Lord give you a heart to be affected by this. Because this is an anointed word that's coming for you. If you are unaffected, you've got to pray, Lord, Give me your heart, because right now I'm unaffected. That means I have a carnal heart. And you promise in Ezekiel 36 that one of the things about salvation is that you will take away my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. You'll put a new spirit in me. You'll wash me with pure water. Listen, don't live like the devil all week and then wonder why you get little to nothing out of a message. It will not Work, God will not honor that. You will be spinning your wheels. And one of these days, the Lord will just pull his hedge back and let the devil bite you where the sun don't shine. Because he will not always strive with man. Okay. So we said all that to say this. The Lord said, I want to come and I want to do this work. But look at what his end game is. Look at what his objective is. That when I do this in the hearts and lives of my people, that they might be or become and then be called oak trees of righteousness. Oak trees are strong. They're big. They're solid. And they grow strong and large and expansive. He said, I want my people not to be little reeds in the wind, but I want your life, each of our lives, to be oak trees of righteousness. I want each of my people to be recognized as clearly, undeniably, as the planting of the Lord, which means you can't do church out of your card trunk. Long term, you will not do church and get this stuff even from live streaming for as good as it is. 
You can't do it. Short term, yes, thank God for it. Long term, because you can't be planted electronically. You have to be planted in the soil of the house of the Lord. And we'll get into a lot of interesting reasons why. But he said, I want my people to be called oak trees of righteousness, immovable, unshakable, deep-rooted. The planting of the Lord, everyone's going to know. Maybe your unsaved family going to look at your life and say, wow, you used to be double-minded, flip-flopping all over the place, blown away by every wind of doctrine and every wind of popular opinion. But man, what happened to you? Your whole life is like rock solid now. It's like you're the only one in our family who knows where they're going and got their head screwed on straight. Say, yeah, that's right. Jesus made me an oak tree of righteousness. When I allowed him to plant me instead of me trying to plant myself, something happened. And look at the end of the day. Our lives are supposed to be lived in such a way and supposed to reflect things in such a way that he might be glorified. Not that we always will have to be comfortable. How can he be glorified and us be comfortable at the same time in every situation? Okay. Now, let me just give you a little bit of intro. Trees are mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible. And I want you to see the parallelisms between the Christian life and the life of a tree. And we're going to get into that. But I want you to just think of Jesus cursed the fig tree, right? When did this whole thing, where did this whole thing start? With the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice it wasn't a block of cheese, it was a tree. Jesus said in Matthew 7, you'll know every tree by its fruit. Someone calls itself a Christian, I want to see the fruit. Because you will bear fruit in keeping with the seed that you've watered inside. If it's a worldly seed, everyone's going to see it. Because your behavior will not change. Your thinking, your speech, your behavior, uh, stuff like that just won't change. And, and then according to Galatians 3, Jesus was what? Hung on a tree. <clears throat> we call it a cross, but it was really a tree. So apart from God and human beings, trees are the most frequent, frequently mentioned thing in the Bible. Why? I believe because we can learn so much <clears throat> about life from the purposes and the life cycle of trees. So then we've got to undertake a study of trees and all about trees to see why God mentions them so many times and why in our opening text, he, he kind of equates our lives or the Christian life well-lived, godly life well-lived with a tree of righteousness. Remember in John 15, Jesus said that he's the true vine and that his father was the vine dresser, the gardener. Again, another agricultural or horticultural illusion there. You know, I was looking at a picture of a CAT scan of a human lung. And it's interesting, when you look at a CAT scan photo of a human lung, it looks like an inverted tree. You know, instead of the, the expansive part being on top, it's the other way around. But it looks just like a tree. And like trees which convert CO2 to oxygen, that's exactly what our lungs do so that we're able to breathe. So if I can sum up discipleship in one phrase, here's what it would be this morning. Be a good tree. Okay. Amen. All right. Amen. 
rooted, plugged in, and fruitful. Be a good tree. So today, even though in life I'm as far from this as you want to find, I'm reclaiming the phrase, tree hugger. Consider me a tree hugger. Because we're all, as believers, supposed to be trees growing together in this forest of faith. Um, I like you to I like you to see a photo up here. See what that is? That's someone's face. No, it's just a. <laughs> it's a. <laughs> someone after a few too many drinks. Oh no, that's their eyeball. Um, it's it's a cross section of a tree, cross cut of a tree. And I want you to just consider for a second. <clears throat> If that tree could talk, all the stories it could tell, all the hard times it had to survive, all the times of drought where it had to dig deep for water, all the harsh times of winter, who knows? But if that tree could have a story, what would that story be? If it could tell a tale, what would it be? And our lives are supposed to be like this. Jesus at the center, but our lives reflecting outward. Knowing that as we reflect our lives outward and grow, and we develop what's called a testimony, and a testimony was going to involve in our life ring after ring after ring, year after year, experience after experience with the Lord. Our lives are supposed to ripple outward to touch people. I said this in the men's breakfast yesterday. Our legacy is supposed to be like Throwing a stone into a still pond. You throw that stone in there, and after the initial explosion, guess what? Then there's ripples that go outward, outwardly, outwardly, and they continue on, maybe all the way to the edge of that pond. That's supposed to be like our legacy. It may come with a bang, but when it's all lived out, it's supposed to be reflecting and impacting people around us in all four directions. But like these tree rings, it's over the course of a lifetime. What, will, what story will your life tell when you stand before the Lord? When he says, it's all, all right, that's enough for you here. What story will your life tell? Just like this tree has lots of stories hidden within the framework of its rings. Okay? Okay, so let's go. We'll just cover what we can in a few minutes here. The four characteristics of healthy trees. Oh, by the way, let's read these scriptures right under our introduction. I forgot to do that. So, Jeremiah 17, verse 7, said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Obviously, that's generic. Blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water. Here again, another allusion to a tree. That extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. And uh, you take uh, five minutes watching the news, the heat is on. When COVID came, it was the Lord saying, the heat is on. Now who is going to stand the heat of the day without backsliding? And many people failed the test. And they're still failing today. Couldn't make it when the heat came. Why? Because the Lord wanted to reveal the fact that their roots were not planted deeply near the waters of life. They probably got to a point already before COVID hit that they were intellectually all about it. But spiritually, they were bone dry. And when they tried to roll the dice when COVID came, the devil ate their lunch. Well, how is it? How is it that tens of thousands of Christians backslide just because of a virus? It wasn't an anti-Christian virus. You know, it wasn't a Twitter virus. It wasn't a Facebook virus. It was a virus. Well, then what does that have to do with my Christianity? 
What does that have to do with my Christianity? Nothing. Well, then how did it all of a sudden take Christians out of Jesus because a virus comes? That's like saying, I have a headache, so I'll backslide. No, you know why? Because they yielded to a spirit of fear. Here, then here. And once you give place to the devil, don't think he's going to give that territory up. He's not going to give it up because you've given him legal rights. You've, you've created a transaction of real estate. And now he knows that he can use fear as a weapon to take you down. Why? Because fear is the polar opposite of faith. You can't have faith and fear at the same time. You can be challenged by fears amid your faith, but you can't really have both in the same cup. You will be yielding to one or the other. Whichever one you feed more in yourself will win. So what did we do during COVID, for example? We determined that we're going to, number one, preach right from this platform. Not out of our basement. I refused. We made videos along the way, Pastor Debbie and I. The worship team, thank God, had the guts to come here and do their worship right from here. Why? Because we wanted to provide a familiar backdrop of faith for you. We had 10 or 12 outreaches during the thick of COVID. Why? Because we weren't going to roll over and die just because the virus was here. We could do things wisely and still move in faith. Still not be knocked off our mission. And we did it. And amid all that activity, not one person, because of our efforts, uh, contracted COVID here. Yes, we closed for 12 weeks. You know why? Because no one knew what was going on. I mean, they still don't, but we know a lot more than when it first hit. I mean, they're not going to tell you that. They still don't. But, but how can they say that without there being utter panic? So when it first hit, nobody knew what was happening. And so we just felt it to be wisdom to say, okay, let's take a break here and let's see what begins to develop. But it doesn't mean that in the meantime, we're going to roll over and play dead. Absolutely not. Then after 12 weeks, we said enough is enough. We're going to regather again, period. Why? Because our roots were always down by the streams of water. And COVID was not going to rip us up out of that place. You understand? It's when pressure comes. Pressure doesn't create a problem. It reveals it. I'll say it again. Pressure doesn't create a problem. It reveals a problem. If your foundation is faulty, certain kinds of pressure will reveal it. And don't think that the Lord won't purposely allow pressure for that very reason. He already knows what's happening, but he needs us to be honest and be aware of what is happening in us or what we think we have that we don't. So that we can straighten it out before it's too late and we get swept away. Again, like tens of thousands of Christians did. Tens of thousands of churches closed their doors during COVID. Tens of thousands. This is serious business. And it's all about the rooting and the planting and viewing ourselves as trees and not just people. It says it be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by the stream. And it will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green. When will the leaves be green? At the most inopportune, inexpl- unexplainable time. Right. When the drought is there, when the heat comes, the leaves are still going to be green. You're going to look at that tree and say, how's that happening? Because we tapped in deep to the right water source. And our roots have been trained to dig and find what belongs to us in Christ. Not what the world says. 
not what COVID says. Couldn't care less what COVID says. Its leaves will be green. Even when the drought's here. Oh, it's drought here. Yeah, so? Our God's never in a time of drought. He's never without an answer. He's not up there saying, Jesus, what are we going to do? Look at the second scripture. I love this. This used to be an old charismatic chorus that I used to love this song. It was called the Green Olive Tree. How many of you remember that song? I'm like a tree, like a tree, like a green olive tree. Wow. <laughs> Two people. <laughs> See, we're only 29. I can't believe that you, I can't believe you don't remember that. But it was my, one of my favorite charismatic courses. Anyhow, the psalmist says, I'm like a green olive tree. Where? In the house of the Lord. I will trust in the mercy and steadfast love of God forever and ever. All right, let's cover one point. Ready? The four characteristics of godly trees. Number one, healthy trees have a deep root system. Healthy trees always have a deep root system. Where are you rooted this morning? I didn't say where are you visiting. Where are you rooted See, the problem with roots to some people is that roots are never flashy. They don't get praise for their work. Everyone looks at the leaves or the flowers or the fruit, and what a beautiful tree. Imagine the roots saying, but what about us? We do all the heavy lifting, and all we do is get dirt thrown on us. See, they do all the work. They're put in an invisible place with little to no recognition other than by people who study trees in a laboratory. They're always working under the surface of things to make sure that the mission succeeds. Much like apostolic ministry is to the church. And no artist, or very few that I know, ever take time to paint a masterpiece that looks like a bunch of tree, tree roots. But you see plenty of landscape scenes painted by very famous artists that depict the grass, the flowers, the bushes, the trees, and all the stuff that goes with it. You know, the average tree I was reading has roots that extend downward one and a half times the height of that tree. The root system goes down one and a half times deeper than the ultimate height of the tree. See how much work those roots do? And they get no recognition, no respect at all. Now, it was interesting. I saw this video clip. It was uh, a clip from a Discovery Channel. And it was a uh, time-lapse photography. And it showed... In the early stages of a tree's life, it almost, things look almost counterproductive in their procedure. Why? Because in the tree's life, almost all of its initial growth heads downward and not upward. But guess what? Discipleship and wise choices in our lives are crucial, and especially at pivotal times in our life. Because we could set our life on a, di a direction God was never in and pay a price. Something would be a good idea, but not a God thing. See, character development is always more important than gift development. And if you jump down to that shaded box, do I have a shaded box on your notes or not? Character development is more important than gift development. Behind every outward success story, there's a much longer developmental process that precedes it. Overnight successes are usually followed by some very public failures. And sometimes God's blessings and protection are in his no instead of in his yes. 
Sometimes the Lord said, if you would have sought me, I would have said no. But you so much wanted to hear yes, that you inadvertently steamrolled it. You know, there's, I was reading about this thing called the Chinese bamboo plant. Now get this. The Chinese bamboo plant. A gardener takes it, he plants it, and he waters it daily. Imagine this job this guy's got. He's got to water it daily for five years. And then suddenly, now he sees virtually nothing, but he waters it every day for five years. And then virtually, a bud pops up out of the soil. For the next six weeks, it makes its way up out of the soil. Then within the next six weeks, it grows 50 to 60 feet tall. Five years of nothingness. But when the Lord says, now, 50 to 60 feet tall in six weeks' time. That's the way our lives are sometimes. When we let God do his thing in our life. That's why Peter was saying, and James said, you know, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Let him do his work in you. Cooperate with him in that work. That in due season, he'll showcase you. Not when you think you're ready, but when he says you're ready. Amen. And for what he says you're ready. Amen. See, the fruit of our lives will bless a lot of people like a great tree. But we got to submit to the process of God and we got to submit to local church leadership because that's what the whole thing is about. God will always want us to grow down before we grow up. So developing a strong root system in our life, I don't mean just in Christianity, but I mean in all the peripheral surrounding connected realities right. are crucial. Think about this. A young married couple. How many believe that developing a strong root system in that marriage can often be the difference between success and failure long term in that same marriage? Right. The root system that's developed early on can set the tone, the direction, and set the table for what could potentially be expected down the road. So we got to be careful, careful with what we allow our roots to go down into. Because there's a lot of pollution down under the surface too. See, shortcuts are dangerous and often counterproductive. I remember years and years ago, when we first launched this church, in fact, was in the first year, maybe the first year and a half, two years the most. But I was still working full time, and, uh, and we had our little rented American Legion Hall in Cromwell, and, and we were working full time and trying to work the church and, you know, praying and believing. And so work all day and have to prepare a message. We had our Thursday midweek services then, and as well as Sunday mornings. And I remember... Had a, a, it was really cold winter day, and you know how early it gets dark. So I get out of work, and I think I whacked my hand with something at work that day, and I had a message, and our, our children were very, very young then. And so we were carting everything and everybody to church on a Thursday night, and we get there, plus my wife and I were leading the praise and worship on top of everything else. And we get there, and three people show up. Why? Because it was cold. But guess where my mind was going? All this work, preparation, aggravation for three people. So we're leading the praise and worship, and this is what I'm thinking about. <laughs> what am I, insane? This is nuts. Praise the Lord. Yeah, this is crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, I was singing the melody, but I was replacing the words, trust me, in my mind. And I could, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just kind of comes upon me. And he said, am I not worthy to be praised even though there's the three? Or just when there's 3,000? I said, yes, Lord, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> so, anyhow, we get through that. But after a few experiences like that, I remember, I get this, I'm praying, Lord, what do you want us to do? I mean, 
if this is going to be the end of it, do you want us to just cancel midweeks, shoot this whole thing in the head? I don't know what you want to do here. Or is it something that we've got to power through? Now, let get this. Now, I pray. Now, listen to this very carefully because the enemy can be very deceitful sometimes. We were praying, what should we do? What should we do? And my wife was a lot more faith-filled than I was. Yeah, there it is. Okay, yeah, I get it. I just joke. All right. So <laughs> all of a sudden, an old friend of mine that I'd grown up a Catholic with, and he he come to Christ too over the years. And someone had told me about him and Long story short, we finally ran into each other somewhere, or he called me. I can't remember. And so I started talking to him, and he said, listen, our pastor's going to be leaving from our church, and I knew the church that he was an elder at. In fact, he was the chief elder. And he said, I'm also the head of our pastoral search committee. Listen, I know you. I've known you. I know things about your church, your preaching. We'd love to have a guy like you come and maybe assume the pastorate here. We have a building. Uh, I think he said we have a, a gymnasium. We have the church. How many? Yeah, about 150 people. And I said, 150? Three. <laughs> I'll go with option A. So, um, so guess what? I'd been praying about, Lord, what do you want me to do? This thing comes. Boy, that looked like an answer to prayer. Right away, though, my wife said, don't even think about it. I said, too late. I'm already thinking about it. <laughs> she said, well, expel it. So, uh, but I see, it looks so right. It looks so right. And guess what? It was a God thing. It was a church. And I was always called, we were called to be pastors. So what's the problem? The problem is, it's not a planting of the Lord for me. That's the problem. It's a good idea in the very role. I've just been praying about what do you want me to do? When I started praying about it, three weeks later it goes by, and the Holy Spirit said, Son, you can do it if you want, but I'm not into it. You're going to short circuit all of your proper developmental work that I want to do in you. In fact, it's the only work that will carry you on long term without getting fried. You will not fulfill the ultimate role that I have for you too, apostolically, if you shortcut the process because it seems right. Don't send yourself, let me send you. So I had to call Dave, yeah can't do it brother what? what no see it's great but we're not called to that we're not called there i'm sorry brother good luck god bless you and of course the lord gave him someone else but you see it looked like an answer to prayer but it would have been long term very very counterproductive we would not be doing what we're doing in the world. Leadership conferences, and uh, you know, if I would have taken that route, because it seems so right. We, learn, we need to learn to rest in our root seasons, in the root deepening seasons and experiences. Sometimes the issues of life will wage war against root formation. You know what? Because the devil wants us to get just so far in the rooting and then go <laughs> jerk us up out of the soil so that our root system goes into shock. If something's going to be taken up out of one soil and into the other, it's got to be lovingly done by a gardener. That root system has to remain with dirt around it, with burlap around it. It's got to be done in a strategic, timely manner and then replanted in short order into a corresponding soil that will be conducive to its future. Not because it felt like it. Think about 
think about, oh, I used to do this all the time to my grandmother and my mother, especially when they smell, oh, bread was baking in the oven. Oh, oof. In fact, when they had the, when my grandmother used to put the dough on the countertop with some kitchen towels around it to rise, I'd come, I'd eat the dough. <laughs> That's stupid, but I, I liked it, you know. And my grandmother, <laughs> then I hear her say, hey! Because there'd be gouges out of the dough, you know. <laughs> and she'd come looking for me. She knew who the culprit was, the dough thief. So, but then when they would go in the oven, can you smell fresh bread? Woo. But guess what I would do? I would always open the oven. Close the oven! Why? Because they're so excited about the bread coming out. If we're not careful, we short-circuit things. It can lead us, leave us with a half-baked harvest. You remember Jesus was talking about the, uh, the parable of the sower. We'll just look at this one scripture right under point one. In the parable of the sower, he, he alludes to one group of people that were victimized. And he gives the reason why they were victimized. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. Since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Amen. See the second scripture, just the underscored portion. Paul said, now sink your roots down deep into Jesus and build on him. You see how many roots, 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 trees, trees, trees. Then the last one. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Then your roots will go down into God's love and it will keep you strong. Amen. Okay, that's all we have time for, guys. I hope you got blessed this morning. I sure enjoyed our time together. Hey, I'm Pastor Petey. And I'm Christina. Thanks for watching today. Let's stay connected. First, click the thumbs up on this video. Next, click subscribe. And lastly, click the Give Now link in the description to support the ministry so that we can continue reaching people all over the world. And if you're in the area, we'd like to personally invite you to join us right here in Middlefield, Connecticut and see for yourself what God is doing with our church family. Thanks again for watching.